Good morning, church. Today's sermon passage is found in the book of Revelation. Will you turn with me there now? It's the last book of the Bible. Revelation 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising sun with the seal of the living God, and he called to them with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given the power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Nephtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Ezekar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this, I looked and behold, a a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and honor blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes? Where have they come from? I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out from the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. He, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst no more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tears of their eyes. Thank you, Autumn. This morning, we continue on in our study through the book of Revelation, and we come to Revelation chapter 7, and as we come to this chapter, you'll notice that there are some numbers. And so one number that I would like for all of us to consider is 99,000. 99,000, that's the number of questions or searches that Google receives every second. It's about eight and a half billion every day, which is about one question per person per day. And those are just the questions that that make it to Google. Questions like, what what restaurants are are near me? What, What jobs? Are available. Why does my stomach hurt? How can I stretch my dollar? What kind of spider has white spots? Why is it poisonous? Like, like these are the questions that we ask. We are a people. We, as people, have lots and lots of questions, all different sorts and, and types of, of questions that, that vary in degrees of importance. And so why begin a sermon on Revelation chapter 7 talking about questions. Well, as we come to Revelation chapter 7, if you remember, we come on the heels of a question at the end of chapter 6. This question, though, it, it differs from all other questions. The question at the end of chapter 6 is the most important question that could ever be asked. At the end of chapter 6, we get this question. Who can stand? There's not a more important question. And that's what our text is addressing today. It's answering this question. 
And what's significant about this question is at the end of chapter 6 is that it's a question about the sixth seal that's been opened. And so to remember what's happened, I want to do a little review, and I want us to go back and to look at chapter 6, starting in verse 12, where we see the opening of the sixth seal. And so look with me at chapter 6, starting in verse 12, reading through the end of the chapter. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold... There was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? What we have here is the final judgment that is to come. It's the end of the world, where the wrath of God is is so terrifying that everyone on whom His wrath is to be poured out will be begging to be crushed by mountains and rocks. And so who can stand against this final judgment to come? This is as far as you can get from an insignificant question. And and I know that we come here this morning with with a whole host of of different questions and and different things even on our mind. And I I know that our minds are busy. We have bills to pay. We're people with impending work projects, deadlines, sick kids. We have chores to do. What's for lunch? Can I afford lunch? Our minds are filled with questions and and temporal things. And and they're not always unimportant questions. But in the midst of of all that, this is a question at the end of chapter 6 about eternity that begs us to listen up. Who can stand? When we open the Word, we are not given suggestions for a better life. We're not given mere recording of historical events. We're given the very words of God. And in Revelation specifically, we're given a true picture of reality. And in chapter 7 of Revelation, we're given the answer to the question, Who can stand? Can you? Can can anyone? Or are we all destined to call out to the rocks to come and obliterate us? Well, as we've heard read this morning already, the answer is not nobody. And that's good news. The reality with our text here this morning, though, is that there's, there's a lot of debate about what's being said, which is becoming just more and more common the further along we get into Revelation. There's a lot of agreement in, within the first couple chapters. And then we, we get to chapter 4, and there's a, there's a little bit of a parting of ways that takes place that really starts picking up and, and presenting itself in chapter 6. And so we saw that last week, right? Like where we see all these different things to expect that at some point, the million dollar question, if you remember, then is when can we expect these things? Some would argue that we can expect these events during this seven year tribulation period in the future at the end of history. Others, including myself, and this is what what John said last week, would argue that the events in chapter six describe the period of time between Christ's resurrection, ascension, and his return. And the reason that I bring all this up to you is because how you interpret and understand chapter 6 determines how you're going to understand and interpret chapter 7. And while there's kind of two bigger camps to fall into, the reality is that there's a whole lot of disagreement and diverging of beliefs, not just on the big things like, like when is chapter 6 taking place or who are the 144,000 in chapter 7, but, but in the weeds and, and in the details as well. And and so I recognize that even what you see on the back of your worship guide this morning is is pretty controversial. What's not on your worship guide, though, and if you don't have a worship guide, that's okay. I I maybe should have put it in there, but, but maybe if you have to write it, it will reinforce this. And so hear this. 
it's okay to disagree. It's okay to disagree. I'm going to qualify that statement that if we agree on the gospel, it's okay to disagree. There, there are essential things that we absolutely need to be unified in. Things like salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We're not okay to disagree on that. But in the non-essentials, it's okay to disagree. In other words, there are scores of people who will celebrate eternity in heaven who don't agree with you and who don't agree with me about Revelation chapter 7. We can fellowship together as members of the same church and disagree on Revelation chapter 7. With all these, with these different interpretations and, and understanding of, of what's happening here, David Platt says, all of the variety of interpretations should drive us to humility and never to despair. We should never think that no one really knows all the answers because someone knows all the answers. He wrote the book. God knows all the answers, and He has made some things abundantly clear in Revelation and in the entire Bible. Christ is going to come back for His people. He is going to usher in the consummation of the kingdom of God, where we are going to reign with Christ and live in the presence of God forever and ever. We know these things. And so there are many different understandings of what's going on here. And it's okay to, to disagree on some of these things. It's okay if you don't agree with my understanding of, of this text. However, I, I fully believe that regardless of where you are today, that this is a good word for you, whether I preach your view or not. Every single one of us ought to leave here today praising God because the answer in chapter 7 to the question in chapter 6, who can stand, is not nobody. And because it's not nobody, there is reason to praise God. So this is a good word, whether you agree with, with my understanding of this text or not. Additionally, when we come to a text like this, it can be easy to approach it only on an intellectual level. And, and what's dangerous about that is that this, this passage should not be approached in order that you might just understand. If that's what we come to this text hoping to do, then, then we've completely missed the point. If that's what we leave here today thinking, then, then I've failed you. I want you to understand this text. I, I do. But more than convincing you of a position, I want to show you Jesus. And to do that, I want to look at the answer to the question, who can stand? And in light of that answer, I, I want you walking out of here, able to, to patiently endure as you rejoice in the good news of the gospel. If you walk out of here with a puffed chest, and your head held high because you can understand Revelation 7 and, and argue your position, you've missed the point. You've missed what Revelation 7 is saying. And so let us as a church come to this text, not just with our thinking caps on, but let's come to, to this text with an abundance of humility, knowing that it's okay to disagree. With that said, though, I want you to know why I hold to the position that I'm going to preach from. For the sake of time and really fairness, I'm not going to walk through every belief that's held about Revelation 7 in detail. I will try to make mention of a few positions when it's called for, but, but where I'll spend the majority of our time is walking you through why I believe what I do. If you want some resources that explain some of the, the different positions that people hold, you come find me afterwards and we can talk about some of those different resources. But just to, to get into all the different interpretations, all the positions would, would likely require jumping all over our text and, and all over our Bibles. Like it's, it's hard to talk about the different understandings of, of verse 4 without also getting into verse 9 and, and verse 14 and Romans and, and Matthew and the major and minor prophets. And, and that's not bad. We're, we're going to look at some other texts and, and reference others, but, but what I don't want us to do is to get lost in the weeds of all these different interpretations where I'm trying to preach really a hermeneutic on how to read the whole Bible and preach chapter 7. There's a place for that. It's not unimportant, but, but we have a lot to cover here. And again, many, many godly people hold to different views on Revelation. We can disagree. 
but you're stuck with me preaching, and so what I'm going to do today is to preach this how I understand it, and I want to talk about a few key ideas or a few key things before we do so. And so we can, to do this, I just want us to get all on the same page, and at the very least, you, you understand why I'm preaching the text the way I'm preaching it. And so as we define some terms, set some context, clarify what we've already seen up to this point in Revelation, that then is going to determine how we read and, and how I preach uh, this book and because of how I understand the passage that we have in front of us this morning. Okay? We're all learners, even me. Here's the first key thing or the key idea to remember. Apocalyptic literature is often symbolic and not chronological. Th this is just something that's true of the type of literature that this book is. Additionally, all the way back in, in chapter 1, verse 1, we read, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. That phrase, made it known, could also be translated as signified. Which is to say that, that John is receiving symbolic visions. And, and so I'd argue that verse 1 tells us how to read the, the entirety of the book. We, we see this at several points, but, but listen just, just briefly to some of the details that we see in chapter 5. In chapter 5, verse 5, this is, this is what we have. We have a, a lion who can open a scroll with seven seals who in verse 6 is actually a lamb that has seven horns and seven eyes. And then in verse 8, we have 24 elders with four living creatures falling down before this lamb, and they have harps and bulls. Like, like that's weird. And, and while there's disagreement about this chapter, most everyone would agree that these things are symbolic. And because we are reading a book that's more symbolic, what we have is more artistic and less linear and chronological. Instead, we're jumping back and forth to gain different and unique perspectives to the things that are being unfolded before us. And so that's the first thing to note. Secondly, and we've already seen it in, in chapter 1 and, and chapter 2, and even last week in chapter 6, that we are currently experiencing the tribulation. And so last week, John walked through all that we can expect right now. Not at some point in the future, but, but right now. The time in between, the first and second coming of Christ. But that wasn't a brand new idea. Chapter 1, verse 9, John says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation. He says it's, it's now. Chapter 2, verse 9, Jesus says to the church at Smyrna, I know your tribulation. They are currently experiencing. It's not a future event. The, the, the tribulation is, is right now. And I, I know that I'm, I'm turning the dial up on, on controversial things to say, but I'm, but I'm trying to demonstrate to you that there's, there's been breadcrumbs. And so as we get into chapter 7, you can, you can see that this has been, been brewing, and it's, it's not just something that's been pulled out of thin air. And so I'm, I'm hoping to show you where there's been these, these little clues along the way. The last key idea to remember is that true Israel are those that are circumcised of the heart who have placed their faith in Jesus, not ethnic Jews. So when you see Israel, don't think ethnic Jews. Think believers in Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. It's a very similar idea to what we see in, in, in chapter 3, verse 9. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Jesus is saying that, that his people are those who have placed their faith in him. I referenced in Romans 2, 28, 29, when I preached on the church at, at Smyrna, and it says this, that for, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. 
But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Those that are truly Jews, the ones that make up Israel, are those that believe in Jesus. And it's only because Jesus fulfills all that God has promised and intended for the nation of Israel that his followers become the true Israel. And it's only in our union with him that this is possible. There is so much more that could be said, but, but, but tuck these things away and consider them as we move through Revelation chapter 7, as we move through our text We just don't have time to to fully flesh out all these ideas. But my hope now is that as we've been in Revelation a few weeks, we've we've done a a little bit of review, that that we've got some some Revelation sea legs. We're ready to look at these four revelations about the end times as we look at the answer to the question, who can stand? It's the question chapter 7 answers. Who can stand? And in doing so, we get four revelations about the end times. What we see here in the first two verses is that God will pour out His wrath. This is our first of of four revelations about the end times. Look with me at at verse 1 and 2. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea. So what, what is happening here? Four angels at four corners of the earth holding back the, the four winds. Some would, would say that this is the four horsemen that we have in, in chapter 6. Depending on, on what day you asked me this week about what I believe, I may or may not have been more persuaded by that argument. But I'm preaching today, and today I would argue that, that this is a specific reference to God's judgment that we see in the sixth seal where these angels, functioning as, as God's servants, are restraining final judgment. The winds representing the judgment of God. When you hear four, think of a compass, meaning winds that would come from the entire world. They would cover the entire world. And now when we read this, we need to remember that with the opening of the sixth seal, we have a great earthquake. The sun turns black, stars fall. It's the end of the world. But when we get to chapter 7, which is pretty hard to read chronologically because there's still earth and sun and sea. And then in verse 3 of chapter 7, which we'll look at more in a moment, the, the angels are told to specifically not harm earth or sea or trees. And so it seems more plausible to me that given the context of chapter 6 and the question that chapter 7 is answering that what we have here in our first few verses is is the final judgment that we see in the sixth seal and not the tribulation that we are currently experiencing. What we have revealed to us is is how anyone can withstand, how anyone can stand the awful event of chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. How is that possible? And so the first thing to, to notice is that you won't stand by just hiding in the right spot. You, you can try like those at the end of chapter 6, but judgment is sweeping. That's what we're told here in the first part of chapter 7, that God will pour out His wrath. He will, which ought to cause us to, to pause. Judgment is coming. Judgment from the God of the universe. What we see here in these first two verses are four angels, but then there's actually a fifth angel who comes with something very significant. He comes with the seal of the living God. In other words, he comes with the authority of God, which is to say that that nothing happens outside of the divine providence of God. He's over it all. This is his judgment. And what we're told will, will happen at his judgment is the destruction of the earth. In other words, if your allegiance is to the things of this world, you need to wake up. Because the things of this world are fleeting and will one day be destroyed. So that begs the question, where is your allegiance? For what and to whom do you live? 
To which kingdom do you belong? The one of this world or an eternal kingdom? Your answer will inform how you live. It will inform how you spend your money, where you live, how you fill out your calendar, where you you spend your, your weekends, who you date, who you marry, what job you do, where you send your kids to school, and so on and so on. In in other words, everything you do is a reflection of who you are and to whom you belong. And so as you look at your life, whose kingdom do you belong to? Do Do your decisions that you make in your life, from the smallest ones to the big ones, reflect a soul that belongs to this world or to another? Do you just do what you want, what feels good, what's, what's best for life here and now on this earth? Or does your life point to a different kingdom? Judgment is coming. And it's not something to play around with. This is real. God will pour out His wrath. And, and chapter 6 makes it pretty clear that judgment is worse than just physical death. The picture we're given is of people wishing death upon themselves in order to escape the wrath of God. Hell is a real place of eternal torment. The only good news for you now is that He hasn't poured it out yet. But He will pour out His wrath. That's what we see coming in verses 1 and 2. Look with me at verse 3. This is what the fifth angel says. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until... We have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And that we'll get to the specifics of the seal in just a moment, but I, I want you to see here is what, is what our second revelation is, that God has sealed those who are His. God has sealed those who are His. Huh, this, this is good news. But before we get to, to those who are His, what this implies is that Either God has sealed you or He hasn't. And so we're starting to get a picture in, in Revelation chapter 7 for, for who can stand, who can endure this, this sixth seal. When, when final judgment come, who can stand? Only those that are sealed by God. What John likely has in mind here is, is Ezekiel 9, where Jerusalem is, is on the verge of judgment for its blatant idolatry. But, but a mark is given to those who, who didn't participate in the idolatry, who instead grieved over the idolatry that was present. Judgment is then poured out on those who don't have the mark. So there, there, there's just two groups of people, those marked by God and those not marked by God. Similarly, what we have here in, in Revelation 7 is that those who are not sealed will have judgment poured out on them. Additionally, later on in Revelation, in chapter 13 and 14, those who belong to Satan will be marked. And so it's fitting that that God would would mark those that are His. If you are not sealed, you will not stand. You will be taken by the wrath of God, and it is final. We saw this idea a, a lot in Proverbs, but we see it all throughout Scripture. There are two paths, just two. Another way to say it is there are only two types of people, believers and unbelievers, those who can stand and those who cannot stand. If you are not sealed by God, you will not stand on that final day. But if you are sealed by God, then then you can stand. Those whom God has sealed will stand. That's good news. Before judgment comes, God saves sinners who in every way deserve the coming judgment. But to protect those that are His from the coming judgment, He seals believers. It's a mark of of authentication, of security, and of ownership. God is saying, I will save you from my wrath, which is to be poured out. When that day comes, you will stand. And He's guaranteeing it with His seal. When you buy a house, part of the the buying process includes putting down what's called earnest money. And what this does is it lets everyone know that you're you're serious about buying this house. It's it's not 
an insignificant amount of money. It's a good faith deposit to say, I'm, I'm going through with this. If I don't, then I lose this money and the house. Well, spiritually, we've been sealed. God has put down an earnest payment. We see this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. It says this, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Which means the only way you don't make it through coming judgment is if God ceases to be God. Which ain't happening. You've been sealed. You can be sure that you will make it because of this seal. This seal is for every believer. Everyone who has trusted in Jesus Christ alone for their, their salvation from the wrath of God is sealed. If you notice, right after the word sealed in, in verse 3, we see that the servants of our God. And what's significant about that is that this phrase is used elsewhere to specifically reference all believers. And so this seal, again, is, is for every believer. This seal, in, it's not a literal mark on our foreheads. It's symbolic for those that belong to God, which is further demonstrated as we keep reading. And as we keep reading, as we come to, to verse 4 in the rest of our text, we're, we're going to have to pay careful attention to what's being said and what's not being said. And the first thing that we notice is that John hears. And so he, he's receiving this vision, and he's seeing these angels at the four corners, and he sees another angel telling them to wait, and, and then he hears 144,000. I'm going to read verses 4 through 9, and then we will talk about who these people are. Verse 4, and I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. 12,000 from the tribe of Gad. 12,000 from the tribe of Asher. 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali. 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh. 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon. 12,000 from the tribe of Levi. 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar. 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun. 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph. 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. Sealed. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. There's a lot of debate about what's happening here. Many people like those who would read chapter 6 as, as something to take place in, in the future, this future tribulation, would, would then understand Revelation chapter 7 and this 144,000 to refer to ethnic Jews who then evangelize this great multitude. And there's some real reasons to arrive at, at that conclusion. And there's other views that, that might not be quite as common about who these people are, but, but there's some real reasons to, to arrive at, at these conclusions as well. I'm just going to tell you how I understand this, and then I'll explain. What we have here is what I'd understand to be the same group of people. These 144,000 are the great multitude, are all believers. All these people are all of those who belong to God. It certainly includes ethnic Jews, but, but only those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. The 144,000 and the great multitude are those that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. It's the same group of people. And now we've already, we've already walked through how to read apocalyptic literature, what to think when we see numbers. We, we've already had symbolic numbers in, in verse 1 of our text today. And we've seen that at other points throughout Revelation. We've been told how to think about ethnic Jews, true Israel. We've already walked through some of the immediate context of chapter 6 and the first part of chapter 7 where I'd argue that there's only two groups of people, those who can stand and those who cannot stand. So I want to mention just a couple of additional reasons to read these two groups as all believers and as the same group 
of people. The first reason is that numbers in this kind of literature, in apocalyptic literature, are symbolic. We've already seen that. You know, here we have 12 times 1,000 times 12. And 1,000, what's important to note, 1,000 was a ginormous number when John was writing this. Think of a child who can be told that they can have a thousand toys. What they hear is that they can have all the toys in the world. Well, so too, we have the full count of the people of God. I, I just can't read these numbers as anything other than symbolic. The second reason, in addition to all that I've already mentioned for why I hold to this view, goes back to chapter 5, and I, I teased it earlier in in chapter 5, verse 5, but it says this, and one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And so John is, he's, he's weeping, and he hears what one of the elders says to him, and then what happens? Verse 6, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. John looks and he sees a lamb. So he hears a lion and he sees a lamb. Both represent Jesus. And so in apocalyptic literature, it's it's normal to hear one thing and and then see another in order to gain a more complete perspective and to to get just more details about the same thing. So look back at at Revelation chapter 7. I already mentioned that that John heard the 144,000 in in verse 4, but what happens in in verse 9? After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude. John hears, and then he sees. The lion is the lamb, is Jesus. The 144,000 is the great multitude, is the people of God. I'll quickly mention now that I also don't think it's insignificant that in chapter 5 we see the lion from the tribe of Judah, that in chapter 7 Judah is mentioned first, and in chapter 5, the lion is the lamb, and in chapter 7, the great multitude is is standing before the throne and before the lamb. But the final reason I'll mention for reading this text in the way that I do is because of chapter 14 of Revelation. Revelation 14.3, no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. And so if you understand the 144,000 to be literal, there's potential problems that you run into when the 144,000 are are mentioned again and are said to be male virgins. It's more plausible then that when reading both Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, that we take this number to be symbolic. Symbolic. And so because of the type of literature that this is, because of the the context, because of how the the servants of God is used elsewhere in Scripture, because of how Revelation tells me to to think about Israel, because of the numbers that are used, because of what chapter 5 and and chapter 14 say, I understand this to be the entirety of the people of God, which means then that this is about you. Who can stand? The question at the end of chapter 6 You can stand. Cross Fellowship Church, you can stand. When the sixth seal is opened and when the wrath of God is poured out, you can stand. Those whom God has sealed will stand. How do I explicitly know this? This is what John, this is what he sees in verse 9. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing, standing so often in life when things are going bad. And it, it is common when, things are, when everything just feels like it's wrong. And, and we, we will say, say something or feel something along the lines of, man, I, I, could just, I could really use a win right now. Hear this. 
You don't need a win. You have a win. You have a win. Here is the great multitude, and what are they doing? They're standing. This is why we sing. I'm fighting a battle you've already won. We know how this story ends. This is the beauty of what's found in this book. This is why this book is for you, to encourage you to press on and to patiently endure. You will one day stand. That's a win. That's better than all others. And so live your life like that's true. Speak like that's true. Suffer like it. Work like it. Weep like it. Rejoice like it. This is you. But it's also all believers. It's more than just you. In our small little church here in Overland Park, Kansas, it's the nations. Be encouraged that Jesus will build his church. If you struggle to believe that, you need to read Revelation 7. Your evangelistic efforts are not in vain. Keep going. And know that God calls us just to be faithful. And as we are faithful, He is faithful to save those from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. He has always been a God that is about the nations. And it is His plan to unite all kinds of people around His throne. Black, white, male, female, Asian, American, Hispanic, tall, short, and on and on. Church, our God saves. Yes, the wrath of God is coming, but there is a group of people who can stand And so praise God and rejoice in the salvation that is yours and get busy telling those around you about our great God. If you can't stand on that day, then this is as good as it gets for you. All the pain and the sorrow in this life cannot compare to the future weight of suffering. But if you can stand, this is the worst it gets for you. All the the pain and the sorrow in this life it cannot compare to the future weight of glory. There's two groups of people. Judgment is coming, but there's still time. We, we saw this back in, in chapter 2, and we see it again right now, that if you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, you can do that right now. The door is never closed for those in sin to turn back as long as they are alive. You can turn from the foolishness of living for this world and place your faith in the one who in chapter 5 was slain and yet was standing so that all those who trust in him can too stand. There are two groups of people. Those who cannot stand and those who can. And if there was any confusion about how it is that one can stand. Our text makes it abundantly clear. God is the possessor of salvation with the Lamb. This is our third revelation about the end times, that God is the possessor of salvation with the Lamb. Look with me at verse 10. We'll read through verse 12, and then we'll stop there. And crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Who can stand? Those who achieve a a certain level of morality? Those that are just smart enough? Those whose good outweighs the bad? Verse 10 tells us that salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne. This is not a text that's ultimately about you. This is a text. It's not a text that we, that we walk away from boasting about our ability to stand. You might be able to stand, but it has nothing to do with you. There's no reason you should stand except for the fact that God, in his mercy and in his sovereignty, as he rules from his throne, decided to save you. You don't save sinners. You don't save yourself. God alone saves If you look through chapter 6 at the horsemen and and you look even back at the angels at the beginning of chapter 7, you'll notice that they all act only as permitted and with the authority of God. Why? Because this is the God who sits on the throne. It is He that is sovereign. He's in control of it all. The same God who is working in you through all of the ordained trouble and pain and grief in your life is the same God that will rescue you on that final day because He is sovereign. 
And so take hope in the fact that as you cry out to this God, He has already met your greatest need in Jesus. You will one day stand. Salvation belongs to our God. And what's the response? Verse 11 and 12. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. He is worthy to be praised. He is not a God that is lacking in, in any of these things. Lack, he's not lacking in glory, and so he wants to receive it as if he doesn't already have it. Rather, he is, he is worthy to be ascribed the attributes he already possesses. Church, we are always worshiping something. Who do you worship? Is your life lived in, in worship to, to the God who is worthy of it all, or, or do you worship that which is lesser? We have every reason to come to a passage like this and to leave rejoicing in the reality that salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. While God is seated on the throne and and sovereign over it all, that the means by which He chooses to save is through His Son. Jesus, here depicted as the Lamb. And in verse 13 and 14, we read this. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these? clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This exchange, this this back and forth, it it exists to, to emphasize the answer that those in the great multitude are in white robes washed by the blood of the Lamb. We see back up in in verse 9 that the great multitude standing before the throne and before the Lamb are clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. These are those that demonstrate that, that they can stand because they are pure and righteous, and so they are full of joy. The big question, really in, in verse 14, is what, what is this great tribulation? Because of what I understand about believers presently experiencing tribulation in in between the time of of Christ's first coming and His second, I don't understand this to to mean a a unique period of of seven years before the end. It's just not how I read tribulation. And it's not how John has has used tribulation in this book. But that still leaves us with with the question, what makes it great? It could be that the suffering of this age, the the tribulation of of this age, increases in intensity right before the end. However, if we understand the 144,000 and the great multitude to represent all believers, then I'd say it's unlikely to be that either. And so I'd argue that this great tribulation is either a reference to to all believers that make it through the tribulations of this life, who, who persevere to the end, who stand on that day having patiently endured, or that the great tribulation is a specific reference to those who escape the wrath of God. Either way, the main thrust here is that the Lamb cleanses God's people. He is the agent by which saints are washed. It is with His blood. This is the the only means by which one can stand. And so if you are able to make it to the end, if you are able to, to patiently endure, and if you are to eventually escape the wrath of God, the only means by which you can do that is the blood. Ephesians 1, 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood. Hebrews 10, 19, we have confidence to enter into the holy places. How? Well, the rest of verse 19 says, by the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Revelation 1, 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth, to Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood. It's nothing but the blood. One of the most 
beautiful images, I'd argue, that we get in, in God's creation is a fresh blanket of snow. What's unfortunate about this fresh blanket of snow is how quickly, especially on streets, it gets destroyed and it turns into this ugly, disgusting, muddy mess. The white robes here are perfectly white. But, but unlike the, the frailty of a fresh blanket of snow, these robes are forever white, having been washed by the perfect and complete sacrifice of Jesus. All your sin washed, made pure. God's wrath, though, is not spared. He must punish sin. Either his wrath will be poured out on you or it was poured out on Jesus. That's the only way you're able to stand because Jesus shed his blood for you as a necessary substitute. That's the only basis by which one can stand. If that's you, if you've been washed by the blood of Jesus, if you are his, it is not your own doing. It is because the Lamb cleanses you. And for these people that the Lamb cleanses, God will one day wipe every tear from their eyes. This is the fourth and and final revelation about the end times, that God will one day wipe every tear from their eyes of those that are His. Look with me at our last three verses, verse 15 through the end of the chapter. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We have here a a beautiful picture of heaven. Where where there is no more pain or sorrow, sickness or grief. What's captured in the idea of of God wiping away every tear is, is this. It's all been wiped away. It's what's promised in Isaiah 25. That's what's fulfilled here. This passage is is given to encourage us. How can we say it is well with all that's broken and painful in this life right now? How can you say it is well when you lose your job, when your basement floods, when the unexpected bills come? when you suffer for your faith, when you're estranged from family members, when you lose a parent, when your womb won't conceive or your unborn child never sees the light of day, when cancer strikes, when all the brokenness and suffering sometimes feel as if they have the final say, how can we say it is well? Because brokenness and suffering and all the trials and tribulations we see don't have the final say. For those trusting in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, there is coming a day when the world will beg to be crushed by the mountains. But Jesus will say, you can stand because everything that I've done extends to you. The life you couldn't live, I did. The death you deserve to die, I died. The wrath of God you deserve to have poured out on you, I drank that cup dry. The new life you need, I purchased for you. The guarantee of it all, I sent to you. Church, when you come to this text, don't see numbers and visions. See Jesus, the Lamb and your shepherd who guides you to the springs of living water where you will drink and thirst no more. Christian, this is the end of the story. Satan does not win. This is our guarantee. This is our hope. So the call is to press on and endure with joy for the affliction of this life is but a momentary blip. There is a better day coming where we will dwell eternally with our Savior and our King, where we will get more of God. 
That's what we've seen in, in verse 15, the enjoyment of his presence. It's contrasted with the picture at the end of chapter 6 where people are, are, are running and, and hiding from, from God's presence. Here we will enjoy the goodness of God's presence forever and ever. That's the beauty of heaven, that we will get God himself. If your idea of, of heaven is a place with, with just all of the best earthly treasures that, that you can think of, you, you have a, a view of heaven that falls well short of the reality of what heaven actually is. You don't get to heaven and get all the stuff of your wildest dreams. You get to heaven and get God, who is far greater than any of the stuff in your dreams or what you could ever imagine. It doesn't happen often. When my wife and I will be away from each other, but, but when we are, when we're separated, it's, it's, it's fairly common for the, um, the party that's returning home to come home to a nice meal or to whoever, whoever's coming home to, to bring a gift or a souvenir from where they've come from. But the greatest gift in, in that moment is, is not a meal or, or any material thing. It's just being in the presence of my wife, being in the presence of my daughter. And, and all that is materially enjoyed is only enjoyed because of their physical presence. That's what heaven is. We will get more of God, more of Him, where we fully and forever enjoy His presence. And as we enjoy God, we will have no lack. Here on earth, we will experience hunger and thirst, dehydration, heat exhaustion, where we, we will crave and, and long for, for food, for water, for just the, the, the cool breeze of a fan. But there, there is coming a, a day when all of that longing will exist no more because we will lack no good thing. This promise is the realization of Isaiah 49.10, and, and oh, what a day that will be that we can look forward to. And it is a day that is coming and when it comes, it will go on forever and ever and ever and ever. For those that are His will enjoy eternal life. The Lamb will be our shepherd, guiding us to streams of, of living water. God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. And so press on, church. Because there is pain in, in this life. There is sorrow and grief in this life. But in the life to come, goodness will reign forever and ever and ever. We will live forever in eternity with our God. We can disagree on what exactly the tribulation will look like and, and when it will take place. But we can agree that God sent Jesus to take on his wrath for us so that we might stand we can disagree on who will experience the tribulation, but we can agree that God cares for those who are His and will see to it that the nations are reached. We can disagree on who the 144,000 and who the great multitude are, but we can agree that God is the author and possessor of salvation with the Lamb. And we can disagree on what's going to happen before that final day. But we can agree that that day is coming. Jesus is coming back. And on that day, he will wipe away every tear from the eyes of those that are his. He is worthy. Let's pray. Lord, we come to a text this morning that leaves us in awe. It leaves us in awe of, of you. Oh, what a, what a gift. What a joy that, that we can stand against your judgment because of the work of Jesus. Would you press the realities of this text into our hearts such that as we, we go from here and as we go into a world filled with heartache, would we, would we do so with, with joy, knowing that our greatest need has been met and would you comfort us with the truths of, of Revelation 7? 
Help us by your spirit to live like Revelation 7 is true. Would we go from here ascribing to you the glory and the praise and the worship that belongs to you? We love you, Lord, and pray all of this in Jesus' name.